Okay, we'll go ahead and start answering questions. And we're so happy to have questions from our satellite sites too. So if you think of something, just raise your hand and we'll send a volunteer to come collect your question and bring it up. And we'll try to answer as many as we can in the time that we have together. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with this one. This question is, given that the longer I take Cinemet, the worse the side effects like dyskinesia and so forth, should I wait as long as possible to treat my Parkinson's? And this is a very good question and it's a timeless question because it comes up again and again. And so it is true that you, you need medication to, to bring out the dyskinesia, but the dyskinesia is actually most influenced by how long you've had Parkinson's. So there have been studies that looked at countries that had limited access to levodopa, so they started it way later. And the time to the onset of dyskinesia was very short because they waited long to start the medicine compared to other countries who took it sooner and had a longer time to onset. And what they figured out is it's not how long you took levodopa, it's how long you've had Parkinson's. So dyskinesia has to do with Parkinson's related changes in the brain to the dopamine receptors and the interaction of that with the medication. So it's better to take medication when your symptoms require it in order to stay active and do the things you need to do to maintain your health and wellness and your social life. And we don't take more than we need, but, but it's it's not recommended to avoid medication thinking you can delay dyskinesia because we've seen that if you wait till the disease progresses and take medicine, the dyskinesia still comes at about the same time relative to the onset of disease. Okay, um, so we got a question. So, um, so actually I wanna go start with this one for the moment. So is exercise still seen as a candidate to delay the onset of Parkinson's disease and um, exercise for alleviation and reduction or management of our Parkinson's symptoms? So um, there's been a lot of research on exercise and Parkinson's disease. And I'm, I'm just gonna say, um, the, the bottom line is we still need a lot more information about whether it delays onset, but we're still studying that particular part of Parkinson's, but we do have a lot of data and evidence that suggests that exercise helps Parkinson's disease patients with their symptoms. And indeed, sometimes people who exercise actually recognize that they see some improvement in their symptoms for a period of time. And it can even be up to a day or even longer sometimes when you exercise regularly. Um, it's good for your health, it's good for your physical and your mental or brain health. Um, so we all recommend regular daily exercise. This does not mean you have to do a triathlon or run a marathon. Um, there are some uh, you know, studies that have looked at more strenuous exercise for sure. But I think what we want to emphasize is really um, that you do the type of exercise that you can do and want to do. So um, almost any form of exercise has been uh, studied from Tai Chi to, you know, biking, running, or swimming. They've all, almost all been studied. Um, but honestly, if you don't want to do it, you're not going to do it. So pick something you like to do and that you're going to stick with and do something regularly. It doesn't require you to be, you know, breaking out that sweat every single day. But, you know, spend a few, uh, you know, 20 to 30 minutes daily trying to do that, okay? Uh, so I have a question here from a patient who asked about, um, he's prescribed uh, Zodago or another name for this is sulfinamide. And the question was whether we've seen this drug uh, improve Parkinson's uh, symptoms. So this medication belongs to the class of what we call MAOB uh, inhibitors. Uh, so MAOB is an enzyme that uh, works on breaking down different uh, neurotransmitters in the brain, including uh, dop uh, dopamine. So if you block this uh, enzyme, it will basically increase level of the dopamine in your brain. So this medication is one that's more recently approved by the FDA um, in the US, I think in 2017. Uh, so it has been shown to have some uh, mild to modest uh, benefit in Parkinson's symptoms and um, studies have shown it can help with uh, some fluctuations. Uh, so, so the short answer is yes, uh, we 
some of the other ones in this class that we maybe prescribe a little bit more often is one called Resagiline or Azelect um, or Selegiline is another one that you may have heard of. Um, so this one is still newer on the market, so we don't have as much uh, clinical experience and usually it is a little bit more costly. So that may be one that could be a limiting factor for um, in terms of access for patients. And, and that's a medication we typically consider in really mild Parkinson's for a mild benefit or as an add-on to be a helper to levodopa. It's not one that is expected to have a very strong, potent effect by itself in more advanced Parkinson's. So it's not as strong as levodopa, but it has enough of an impact that it got approved by the FDA as a medication. All right, hello. Um, just for quick reference, I'm not a doctor, but I am a registered dietitian. My name's Carly. Um, here to answer some of the nutrition and diet related questions on the panel. So um, everyone quick hide their sodas. <laughs> No, just kidding. I'm not the food police, but we do have a sugar question. So this question is, should Parkinson's, people with Parkinson's try to avoid or reduce their intake of sugar? And have we seen any results from a specific diet plan? So um, in terms of overall intake from sugar, that answer is going to be yes, just because uh, we do know that eating more and more sugar um, in our diets is associated with other chronic diseases um, like heart disease, diabetes, uh, cancer, and um, even with Parkinson's, um, I would still recommend trying to reduce your sugar intake as an overall healthy diet choice. Um, and then in terms of specific diet plans, uh, unfortunately, there isn't as much research in nutrition for Parkinson's, but that's kind of my goal here at the at UF Health. Um, and we actually just finished up a, a pilot study uh, looking at using the Mediterranean diet to help improve uh, constipation symptoms and Parkinson's. And we have some really promising and um, great data from that showing that it could be beneficial with promoting a more regular bowel movement and um, not spending as much time in the bathroom, things like that too. So more research on that to come, but we don't have all the answers for that yet. Um, so uh, uh, I have a question um, about precision medicine. Uh, and the question is, uh, since the precision medicine approach requires looking at individual patients, uh, is the uh, cost of this research prohibitive? Uh, don't you need tremendous numbers of clinical trials uh, and projects and participants to show efficacy? So uh, it's a very good question. Um, so I think that the, the level of preciseness that this person is imagining is not, not quite the same level as what we're imagining when, when physicians talk about precision medicine. In general, when we say precision medicine, what we're imagining is smaller groups of patients who have particular subtypes of the syndrome that we tend to call Parkinson's disease. So it's not that every individual is absolutely unique. Um, it's that different groups have this constellation of symptoms as a result of ideally different mechanisms of disease. So LERP2 would be an example a small group of people who have a mutation um, that causes overactivity of an enzyme, and then we can, with a drug, target the activity of that enzyme and treat that subgroup. So although such an approach would create um, more numbers of trials, the, the number of participants could be lower because, in theory, you, you would be confident that each small group has a mechanistically linked uh, uh, disease process. And so the, so the smaller trials would still be powered to see a real effect, even if the, the, the number of participants was not 5,000, but instead 50 or 75. And the lower number of participants, the less expense. And so I think that's how you manage this concept of precision medicine and the cost of multiple clinical trials while still seeing reasonable outcomes. I'm Dr. Moore. I'm one of the fellows at UF Health. I have a question here that says, what can you do as a caregiver to help with apathy and depression of a spouse? So there, this is going to be a tricky question. Um, first of all, 
letting us as the doctors know, because as, as I discussed in my talk, there are things that we can do to help um, from a medication and a referral to therapy, um, but really helping somebody to um, identify that in themselves and be able to tell the physician to keep regular activity and regular structure. And this in particular includes exercise. So you'll hear that as a theme over and over. Um, exercise can be good for mood as well. But I recognize that this can be particularly challenging, um, especially if apathy is interfering with someone not wanting to do anything. Yeah, so thank you, Arlene. So the, the comment, the question was about how can you help someone with apathy, which is a lack of motivation or interest or drive. And the, the comment was, don't forget to refer caregivers, just caregiver support groups, because it can there can be a lot of frustration when you really want what's best for the person you love and they don't really have the drive so it looks as if they don't care or they're not trying but really this is part of the condition sometimes and at the same time they may have good days and bad days and you might see the person doing certain things someday and thinking why aren't they doing that the other day they can do it and it might be the nature of Parkinson's and, and that can cause a lot of frustration in a caregiver and that's absolutely true that caregiver support is really important. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to comment. So th this is a this is a really challenging problem for us. There, unfortunately, is no drug just to fix apathy or just lack of motivation. Um, this is a frustrating thing for us. We do have medicines that help with mood, depressed symptoms, and things. Some are you know there's a whole panoply of medications. Some are more we call activating that might give a little bit more oomph or energy or however you want to put it. Um, but they don't always work. So uh, a couple of things that, at least in my practice, or we've sort of talked about is, you know, a couple of things you can try to do is, um, you know, I think we're all kind of uh, creatures of habit. So I would sort of suggest if you are a caregiver or working with someone who has sort of lack of motivation or apathy is um, try to think about a regular daily routine and a schedule um, to try to keep activities, schedule a daily activity it's sort of like, I don't know, those of you probably, many people have kids in the fan out here, rather than telling your kids, uh, sort of, um, would you please help me with the, the table? Says, sort of say, please help, please set the table. <laughs> um, sort of telling them to do this uh, rather than asking. Um, so kind of schedule things, uh, schedule sort of exercise, schedule sort of some routines um, that are less optional to do. And that might actually sometimes help. I'm not saying this is perfect, um, but these are some strategies that you might try to use and employ um, along with, you know, talking with us about potentially medications, other things. Just a thought. Oh, sure. Um, questions. So um, a lot of you had questions based on this morning's sort of talks about research about um, DNA testing and biomarkers. So actually this was about should I get DNA testing for my Parkinson's disease to help me um, start treatment as soon as possible? I'm really glad you're thinking about these things. Um, absolutely, um, to date, we've been treating symptoms mostly and exactly what Dr. Espe was saying this morning and we're kind of hinting at, we would love to start treating you all with disease modifying therapies. And I think one of the things we all are recognizing is the earlier we can kind of identify that you have Parkinson's symptoms, and the earlier we treat it, the more likely we can sort of stave off or slow the disease down. But we're gonna to need to find markers or things that actually help us. Uh, we're all pretty good at diagnosing Parkinson's disease when we see it, but it's not. that's not the time where we wanna start those treatments. What we wanna to try to do is find markers, whether they are sort of blood or imaging or other markers that would increase our sensitivity to detect whether you have early symptoms of Parkinson's disease, things that I, you know, can't see maybe physically on you um, when you come into my office with that tremor or that gait problems. So we were talking about maybe years before you develop symptoms. So things like genetics, um, uh, molecular markers in your blood, or imaging things, we are actively looking for those things. Um, so we're actually at the University of Florida UF Health, we're starting, we have a biomarker program that's very active. Um, as part of the Fixal Institute, we hired um, a world-renowned geneticist, Dr. Matt Fair, 
who's already has actually 40,000 samples from around the world from Parkinson's disease patients and is uh, looking at complicated genetics. Um, I think I could say pretty safely that those of you who are thinking about, we call monogenetic, sort of single gene things that cause Parkinson's disease are fairly rare, okay? We've pretty much identified most of those. Um, you may have heard things like LERC2 thrown around the room or some other um, genetic, we've kind of discovered those. What we're probably gonna be looking at are multiple genes. We all have like 20,000 genes in our chromosomes, so there's a lot of things. And of that, there's you know millions and millions and millions of DNA in there. So um, what he's looking at is actually risk factors and multiple different patterns. It's almost like a G DNA fingerprint that might help to figure out whether you're at risk for developing Parkinson's disease and maybe even are you at risk of having more severe disease versus maybe a slowly progressive disease or whether you might have dementia later on or, or, or whatever. I mean, those are the things that we're trying to look at. It's gonna take a lot of effort and a little bit of time, um, but we're going to be asking you all um, to participate if you'd like to um, in giving us either sort of a saliva cheek swab or saliva um, or even blood or other samples. So um, you can be part of the solution and help us out. Um, this is kind of turn this whole thing on, on its side. We really like to figure out um, your Parkinson's disease, your Parkinson's symptoms. So um, this is part of that solution. Um, someone else asked about, uh, this is sort of related to the DNA thing about environmental things. I'm gonna answer that right away too as well. Um, and whether that's something we do know that genes sort of load the gun, okay? And that there are some triggers in the environment, whether it's stress or something in the environment that might set off your disease. At least that's a theory that's been proposed by many of us. Um, so one thing about that is that environmental causes kind of are things in the environment that are really hard to get at. Um, they require lots of people, um, population-based things to figure out. You imagine sort of if you're exposed to something, we have no idea whether it's something that happened 50 years ago and if you're exposed to it one time or whether it happened over a course of 20 years of working on a farm or in a factory, that's really hard to get at. Um, environmental factors are things that can't be passed on. So if someone asked about, this is something that could be transferred to my children. They aren't passed on, um, but obviously if you're if they're living with you or exposed to the same sort of environmental factors, um, then they might be affected by the same thing, okay? Sort of it's in the same water, it's in the same um, neighborhood, um, some sort of factor, then that's the way it would get. But environmental factors don't get generally get passed, only so that's not what we think. You know? Uh, so I have a question about whether DBS is a good solution for tremors if medications don't work. Um, so the short answer is uh, yes, in the sense that tremor is one of the motor symptoms that can be very challenging to capture with medications, even when we use the best medication we have uh, with carbidopa, levodopa. Um, so when you have tried all these other different medications, run into side effects, etc., and tremor remains your most bothersome symptom, it is a good time to talk to your doctor whether more advanced therapies such as deep brain stimulation may be an option. Um, the caveat I would say is that, um, so if let's say you are being considered as a candidate uh, here at University of Florida and elsewhere too, it's usually a multidisciplinary process because other than figuring out what your most bothersome symptom is, when we look at you as a candidate, we have to evaluate things like what your uh, memory cognition is like. Um, we have psychiatry that will evaluate you. You'll see our therapists, and of course you'll meet with our surgeon. And then uh, we meet as a whole big group to discuss whether there are other factors that we might be concerned about, You know, let's say other than your Parkinson's and tremor that might make you not a good candidate. So um, not exactly a straightforward answer when you have to take into all the other things, but tremor, uh, refractory tremor in and of itself, um, that can be very amenable uh, to therapy such as deep brain stimulation. Great. So this question goes back to Dr. Espe's talk and said, what are some practical things that people with Parkinson's can do 
to advance the cause of the philosophy there is no Parkinson's, only people with Parkinson's. So Dr. Espe's talk was about how we lump it all as Parkinson's, but you might know five people with Parkinson's and they all have a very different Parkinson's. So somebody might be very active and have mild symptoms, someone have, may have very advanced symptoms, someone may have cognitive difficulties, and someone else may be doing very well. So what, how do we deal with that? And as people with Parkinson's, what can we do? So one of the things is participate in research. So there are different ways that research goes about this question. One of them is what Dr. McFarland alluded to, the biomarker stuff. Um, so there is this vision in the future that we would take a blood test and it would tell us what genes you have and that'll tell us what medicines are gonna work for you. And that might happen. There's already something like that in psychiatry that's being kind of applied called pharmacogenomics where they do a blood test and predict which medicine someone may be sensitive to or not sensitive to. So that might be down the road. At this moment, one thing is for these biomarker studies are saying, what can we see in common between people with Parkinson's or different in different subtypes, for instance, that we could detect in blood or saliva that'll help distinguish are there different clusters that happen? The other kinds of research are just database research that doesn't even necessarily take blood or spinal fluid or saliva, and those just catalog symptoms, and we might see for instance, many of you might be involved in the Parkinson's Foundation, uh, Parkinson's Outcomes Project, where once a year you walk the, the distance with Amanda and answer some questions. That study is looking at how are you doing and what symptoms do you have and what is the doctor doing your therapies and how does that change what happens down the road? So we sometimes don't just look at symptoms and say, people who have a lot of tremor, maybe they do better with deep brain stimulation, maybe people who have this problem are more likely to have falls and then we can target the therapy. So participating in research. The other thing is in today's world, you can communicate with your doctor about the, and your therapist about the kinds of symptoms you have and those change over time. So what bothered you a year ago isn't what bothers you today and what medicines worked a year ago aren't necessarily what worked today. So communicating about what bothers you the most, which doesn't always manage what looks like it would bother you the most and letting us address the symptoms, because we do have some awareness of what medicines influence what symptoms. So having good communication is another way to try to get your specific things that you suffer with addressed. All righty, um, now I'm getting some more questions on gut health, so they're deferring them to me. Um, so this one is, please explain, please explain how sugar intake um, affects our gut health. And then there's another second part with um, medications too, but I'll first answer the sugar intake. So um, we hear a lot in the media, in the news about how our gut health is important. We're starting to hear more about that now with Parkinson's disease too. And what that's referring to is our microbiome in our gut. And when I mean microbiome, it just means the totality of all the bacteria, fungi, viruses, even DNA that lives inside of our gut. And why people are really interested in that, including myself, is because um, it can really impact our immune system and just how healthy we are over time. And um, like I mentioned before, they're starting to see that there are some changes in Parkinson's um, in that microbiome. Uh, but when it comes to sugar intake, uh, what researchers have found is that the more sugar someone eats throughout their lifetime, they start to see changes in that microbiome where they might have less beneficial bacteria living inside. So maybe they can't um, fight off an infection as well down the line and things like that too. So more sugar intake over time could affect the, the number of beneficial bugs in our gut. Um, and then the next question was about um, how um, Carb, the efficacy of carbidopa and levodopa, um, how that's involved in the gut. And this is kind of two different things. So um, number one, motility. We've talked about that before. So if you have, um, if things are moving slower throughout the gut, that also can affect how effective your medication is. So maybe instead of it working in 20 minutes, now it takes an hour, or maybe sometimes not even that great at all um, to really take an effect. So um, this motility in the gut. Um, in terms of the microbiome, 
we don't have all the answers for it yet, um, but there is some clues that maybe there are some changes going on in the bugs in our gut when we're taking certain medications or making them more effective or less effective. And the other thing too, with, or in relation to motility, I forgot to mention is I do anecdote anecdotally have some people say that the more constipated they are, the less effective their meds are. So um, that's something to also keep in mind, but there's not really a lot of data on it just yet. Yeah. <clears throat> and one final thing that can be a relationship between what we eat and how our medicine works is sometimes if you take your medicine with a large protein load, it can interfere with the absorption of it. So some people find that their medicine helps them more on an empty stomach and taking it half an hour before you eat or two hours after you eat will make it more effective. Now in early Parkinson's, that's not so critical. People can usually take it with their meals as a way to remember to take it and to structure their day and it usually works pretty effectively. But if you find that you're not getting enough out of your medicine, you might notice that what you're eating with your medicine is impacting how it gets absorbed. And you can ask us for advice and we can help you kind of adjust things to try to get around that. And that's where one of one of the therapies that we didn't really talk much about today was Duopa, which is a, a, a tube that goes past the stomach into the intestines so that the food in the stomach doesn't necessarily interact with the absorption and then the medicine gets infused into the intestine. So uh, that's not for everybody, but it's just to say that food and medicine do interact. Uh, so I have a question about neuroinflammation. And the question is, uh, do you want the, uh, don't you want the cells to chew up the infection or toxic agent? Uh, why neutralize cells that would chew up inflammation? Um, so the, the questioner, I think, rightly perceives a potential tension between two dominant hypotheses in clinical trials right now. The first is that um, we want to inspire um, features of the brain's immune system to chew up the alpha snook, the bad protein or the toxic agent, whatever it is. And we juice up the immune system to do that. Many of the antibody treatments for alpha synuclein, the small molecules, and also the treatments for LERP2 and GBA, that's the hypothesis that drives that work. There is also work looking at neuroprotection in which those experimental drugs attempt to quiet down inflammation that may make dopaminergic cells sick. But there, you're right, there is this tension. On the one hand, we're trying to juice up the immune system and create a kind of a therapeutic inflammation. On the other hand, with other drugs, we're trying to quiet down what may be that same quote unquote inflammation. So there, you're right, there are tensions between those hypotheses, and ultimately the, the answer is assessed empirically. We, we have to do those trials with those drugs, try and get as clear an understanding of how those drugs work, or if those drugs work, and see which wins out uh, in the, the sort of marketplace of ideas. But um, That's a great point, but it's not even just, most of those trials aren't looking at uniformly um, flaring up the immune system. They're actually trying to do targeted antibodies only to give the person targeted antibodies that are marked to fight against alpha-synuclein, a Parkinson protein. So not globally to make their immune system more agitated, but a specific component. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the only thing I would add really is just um, understand your immune system is very complicated. It is sort of like a double-edged sword, okay? We know our immune system's there to fight off infections. Um, and when you block the immune system, um, you are more prone to getting infections. If you block it, you also might also be more prone to getting cancers. So we uh, recently sort of understand that the immune system's important actually to get rid of those cancer-like cells. So the immune system plays a, a really important role in your body. But it is quite complicated. There are different portions of it. Um, your cells produce little sort of uh, signals to tell your immune system to do things to attack cells or to eat them up or you know to protect things. So there's kind of it's this ongoing battle in your body of what's you know telling your immune system to kind of fight things and then protect you and at the same time. So 
Um, we'll be doing a lot more research on this. It's a really fascinating area here um, for the immune system, but we can actually really do very specific targeting of the immune response um, in drug trials. So this is probably going to be a big area. It really actually is already a very large area of active research um, that's going to be going on. So um, there's more than just kind of giving people antibodies or doing a vaccine. Um, you know, it may be as simple as sort of, um, is the immune system there to, uh, in the gut, to sort of fight off some sort of environmental thing that revs it up? Um, is there something in the gut that sets off your immune system that starts the process of Parkinson's in some individuals? Um, so we'll be looking at that. So it's really a fascinating area of study, actually. So um, did you, let me answer a couple other questions here. Someone asked me about so this is related to the genetics. So if you want to volunteer for genetic testing, we're going to be doing it. We're going to be ramping up um, very, very soon. We just needed to have all the infrastructure taken care of and then bringing in Dr. Fair um, to actually do this. And it's a big project. It's not a tiny project. Um, uh, genetics requires everything from doing the testing to actually processing a ton of data. So this is going to be a university-wide thing. Um, we're looking at doing it. We're going to make it happen. So it's very exciting. We're, ex we're extremely excited for it. Um, so we'll be asking you guys as you come through the clinic soon. You'll be seeing that, um, and hopefully we'll consent to doing that. Someone asked a really quick question. I can answer this one very quickly. It's just about the different projects we have, and how do you know what's what's a good project, what's not a good project, what are the criteria that we use. Um, they asked about the IRB and IND. These are a lot of questions here um, that, are, that are complicated. Um, there is this alphabet soup of different regulatory agencies that we have. Um, one of the most important was is the IRB or the Institutional Review Board. Um, this is a board of both lay and physician and scientists that actually review any study. And it's not just at a university, pharmacies, other programs that do research have to go through this too. Um, even other countries have similar kind of review boards to make sure when we do research that it's done in a proper way and that we are not going to harm somebody or take advantage of them. Um, so that's just one part. There are many other parts, but I think the main question here is about um, if you're going to be invited, how can you tell? Um, it's a bit complicated, but what I would suggest to you is first and foremost, if you get invited to be part of a study, um, please come and ask us about it. Don't be afraid. We're, we're here to help you guys sort through the studies. There are a ton of them out there. Um, some of them are really junk. Um, you know, they're, they're not really got any backing. They may have the wrong scientific premise. They might actually be dangerous to you. And, um, they might be something you shouldn't be participating in, and we'll, we'll be happy to tell you that. Um, yes, we may have some slight bias, but um, we'll be as honest as we possibly can. Um, a thing you might want to do, and I think uh, Dr. Burns mentioned it, is a number of websites. One good website is actually clinicaltrials.gov. Um, most all clinical trials need to be registered now on clinicaltrials.gov, especially if we want to publish the results. We're required to do that. So one thing I would do is you're being asked to do a study, make sure it's registered. If it's not registered, it might be bogus. Um, they might be just taking your money. Um, I really recommend if they're, you know, if you get invited to be part of study and they're charging you money, <laughs> they're charging you money, yeah, thousands of bucks probably you should go walk the other direction, <laughs> okay? Uh, but do ask us. Uh, so someone asked whether weight loss is common in Parkinson's, either with or without loss of appetite. Uh, so weight loss is something that we can see probably more in advanced uh, stages of the disease. But I think the bigger question would be um, what is causing uh, the weight loss in terms of is this, you know, potentially a symptom of the your depression, and so you might have a change uh, in your appetite, or could this be um, secondary to if you have really severe dyskinesias, which is those uh, involuntary weekly dance-like movements, as a side effect of your other medicines, um, and those excess movements, what's causing your weight loss? Um, then we need to 
manage that and, and treat accordingly, and we do have medications that can help with that? Um, or is it because of with trouble swallowing? Um, and again, uh, speech and swallow evaluations, we recommend that at least annually, and for those who are having trouble, you may need more frequent evaluations. Um, so I think, you know, getting to the root of what's causing the weight loss is helpful. And uh, Carly might be able to give more recommendations from a dietitian standpoint on how to manage when you do have weight loss problems. So <clears throat> we'll maybe finish the line. We've, we're kind of at the end of our time together. So we'll finish the line. And then if there's a question that didn't get answered, we'll stick around that you can grab us maybe when you didn't want to share with the room. Um, also, please fill out your feedback questionnaires. We want to know what you want to hear, what you liked, and what you didn't like. We want to improve every year. So a couple quick ones were with the coronavirus um, spreading in China, and since many drugs are made in China, is there a threat to manufacture and or delivery of PD-specific drugs or therapies? Excellent question. We don't know. We, we, it's too early to know what the extent of that impact will be on the healthcare system. I know I personally went to get a cell phone last week and they said our inventory is low because the, the factories are closed and they're not selling them, they're not sending them. So some, some things are affected. Um, hopefully that's gonna be temporary and, and I'm not sure. We have not heard of any shortages emerging. We haven't heard of any disruptions in availability at this time. Why won't my insurance cover the treatments I need, like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy? And this makes us all tired and we want to just lay down because we're so frustrated with the insurance having such an impact on what care people can receive. So the reason why is, is kind of sad. It's mostly financial. So the insurance company does well financially by not paying for stuff. And so um, they can pose limitations and, and it makes us frustrated. So um we you know you can you can advocate with legislature you can vote for people who endorse things that are helpful for us and you know we all do the best we can we're all frustrated by that and finally multiple sclerosis has been for me and we'll pass it down multiple sclerosis has been reported to be an autoimmune condition how does this compare to parkinson's so multiple sclerosis is a condition where the immune system attacks coding of parts of the brain of people instead of attacking only bacteria and bad stuff. And so sometimes a little protein in the bacteria mimics something in our brain and the antibodies get confused and target the wrong thing. And so this is a condition where people have um, attacks on their brain that can result in a lot of different types of disabilities. So to our knowledge, Parkinson's is not an autoimmune condition, although the immune system and inflammation may play some role, but we don't know of this a similar um, pathophysiology, meaning cause of Parkinson's at this time. All right, another gut health question. Uh, my thoughts on probiotics and any recommendations. So a lot of people might not even know the definition of a probiotic, so I will quickly define that for you. Um, so you'll hear actually three things out there, a probiotic, a prebiotic, and a symbiotic. What a probiotic means is a, bact a bacteria or a live organism that can give the host, meaning like ourselves, a health benefit once we take it. A prebiotic is, a, it could be a food, a substance, anything that helps feed the organisms in our gut to promote a health benefit. And a symbiotic just combines the two. Um, so probiotics, um, right now there's not a lot of good uh, research on that with Parkinson's, but there is a lot of research on probiotics for other health benefits. And what I would say is, is that probiotics are not a one size fits all um, benefit to everyone. Um, in the research that I've done, we see people who respond really well to probiotics and others that don't. So what I tell people is, number one, why do you want to ask yourself, why do you want to take a probiotic? A lot of the um, biggest concerns is constipation. Um, I will say that probiotics haven't been really shown to be very effective for constipation, but prebiotics, so think like fiber, things like that could actually be more beneficial. Um, and the other thing is once you figure out what you want to why you want to take a probiotic, um, work with your doctor or a dietitian to figure out which probiotic would be best for me. Because like I said, it's not a one size fits all approach. And then number two, or sorry, number three, once you do start taking it, keep track of your symptoms. Like, do you have any benefit? Is anything um, noticeable to you? Um, is there anything um, 
bad, like an adverse reaction that you've noticed, and really try to track that benefit over time and see, is this something that's worth taking um, throughout my daily routine? Uh, so one question I have is, uh, has, uh, has any of you known of anyone who reversed PD? And if not, do you believe that it's possible? Um, so I, I, I think I would say several things. Um, there are groups of patients who have Parkinsonism, which basically means symptoms that look like PD but are caused by something else, maybe. For those patients, some of those have Parkinsonism because of a drug or a nutritional deficiency. Although it's sort of a trivial case, if you, if you stop the drug or replace the nutritional deficiency, in those patients who have Parkinsonism, their symptoms can be reversed. Um, but that's not the majority. Um, I would say that uh, I see many patients whose symptoms are improved dramatically with effective therapy, medications therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, and sometimes surgical therapy. And for many of those patients, their symptoms are managed effectively for long periods of time. At that point for those patients, the distinction between reversing PD symptoms and reversing PD becomes academic um, because they're able to live the life they want to live, managing the symptoms they have effectively. Um, finally, what I would say is of the evidence available for slowing or stopping progression of disease, uh, exercise is the thing that looks best. Um, so that evidence is not ironclad, but of the evidence that exists. Um, exercise seems to have an effect at slowing progression of disease for patients who have the real McCoy, not the Parkinsonism or nutritional deficiencies. Um, having said all of that, I think there is a general belief that um, right now, if you have the real McCoy, um, there is no medication that can slow or stop progression of disease. And that's why there's such a tremendous effort uh, to identify those treatments. Uh, uh, so that's, that's, I think, as honest answer as I can give about that. Okay. So this questionnaire writes, Parkinson's and narcolepsy. Um, so what I can tell you is that narcolepsy is uh, a separate neurologic condition from Parkinson's. We don't really see the two being particularly related, but we, there are a number of sleep conditions that can occur in Parkinson's disease, including something called sleep attacks, which is maybe what you're getting at here. Um, sleep attacks mean that you're eating or driving or interacting with people and you fall asleep during those activities. It's not quite the same as, you know, watching a movie and falling asleep, because I feel like we would all do that. Um, but sleep is a really important thing to be thinking about and managing in Parkinson's disease. People have trouble um, falling and staying asleep, as well as excess um, daily, uh, daytime sleepiness. And so a lot of that's affected by things like nocturia, which is getting up at night to go to the bathroom, um, wearing off of your medication overnight, um, sleep hygiene, which is a fancy term for not using your cell phone right before bed and making sure the TV and the radio are off at, in the bedroom, things like that. So there's a number of things we can do to work with you and help improve your sleep. Sometimes if it's confusing, we will need to get something called a sleep study where we monitor your breathing and your brain waves and your movement and all kinds of things while you sleep. And that can give us more information. And, um, you know, certainly if we're talking to you about your sleep problems and your symptoms suggest a separate condition like narcolepsy, we'd want you to see a sleep doctor. Okay. Then I have another question from a patient who's had PD for uh, or diagnosed for about four years. They say, recently I'm struggling with my energy level each day, as well as mild confusion while doing daily tasks. Can this be improved and how? So first I would say, yes, I have every hope that those things can be improved. Um, both energy level and confusion are impacted by a lot of things in Parkinson's disease. We know that people um, sometimes will have these findings occur as the disease progresses. You're more likely to have uh, slowness of thinking uh, fatigue and decreased energy and there's like I said there's a number of things that go into it number one is sleep um, you know if you're not sleeping well um, you may feel fatigue and confusion that's certainly what our training 
has been like <laughs> um, uh, in residency. We are very familiar with what that feels like. Um, but also medications that you're taking. There's some medications that can cause sedation and can, uh, you know, by that effect, cause energy and confusion problems, um, nutrition, pain, wearing off and on, medication burden, all those things can really contribute. So this is something that would need to be an individualized discussion. And I would just end by saying, if you have a particular concern or things that are coming up as you're hearing about things that we're discussing in the symposium today, make sure to bring it up to your doctor. We certainly try to go through a whole litany of questions of motor and non-motor symptoms when we see you, um, but it's very helpful if you say, I got this one doc, this is my problem that I wanna talk about today. So. Thanks for being here. And a few final comments. We'd like to thank the Stockdale Lecture Fund that helped make it possible to bring Dr. Espe to talk to you all the way from Cincinnati and the Parkinson Foundation, um, a long-term partner of ours. A, they have a great website. They have a lot of great resources to learn about Parkinson's and mostly to thank all of you for coming out on a Saturday and spending time with us so we can learn from each other. Um, and hopefully we'll see each other again next year at next year's symposium. Thank you.